middle. Yeah, sorry. While you're doing that, I'll just let, let me introduce the panelists while we get them working to chair, move the chairs. I'm sorry about that. Um, on this panel, we have Azar Majadi, who's chair of the Organization for Women's Liberation. She's a writer, a podcaster, and a leftist political activist. Sitting next to her is Mashad Afshar, whose film you just saw and who I introduced earlier. Uh, sitting next to her is um, Elika Ashuri, who is an, uh, a British-Iranian actress and activist. She's the daughter of Anusha Ashuri, who was a British hostage held in Iran for five years in Evin prison. Next to her is Hala Letahiri, who's executive director of the Middle Eastern Women and Society Organization. She was a Kurdish freedom fighter after the establishment of an Islamic regime in Iran. And to the end, we have Zara Kay, who's a Tanzanian ex-Muslim atheist activist based in Sweden. She's the founder of Faithless Hijabi. Lisa Marie Taylor, the uh, CEO of Filia, was meant to chair the panel, but she had an um, emergency, and she couldn't come, so you're stuck with me. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not sure if... Oh, yeah, it works. Okay. Uh, so, I think maybe, I'll stand here so you don't have to look at me. <laughs> um, I think it would make sense to start with that film, because that was really um, such an interesting uh, thing to see, given the fact that we know their position on women, but it is good to have it all compiled. And, of course, that's a very small bit of what their view of women is. I'd like to ask you why you make this short film and uh, whether you think it represents really their view of women and Islam's view of women, really. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mariam, for organizing such an amazing event. Um, well, this is part of me torturing myself, like watching these kind of footages every now and then. I was uh, born and brought up in Iran, so we were kind of indoctrinated in the same, you know, uh, schooling system, same way of looking at women, uh, and it's it's quite annoying to even hear their voice. I'm quite traumatized myself listening or seeing their faces, so I stopped watching everything related to Islamic channels way back when I chose to live in exile after being arrested in Iran 15 years back uh, when I lost, saw my country, when I left everything behind. Um, but in a way, I thought it's quite relevant, especially now with Women Life Freedom Movement, um, to, because some of the Western people do not know exactly what we are talking about when, we, when this is uh, so important to us, when we talk about that kind of anger that you brought up, we are angry. Mm -hmm. We are brought up in a system that humiliated us, degraded us, didn't count us as human beings. And that's why we have to listen to these words and know who are you know, these type of people and why Women Life Freedom Movement is so important, why these kids at school are rebelling against mullahs about Islam because, you see, you are going to school to make yourself a better human being. You want to be successful. You want to make best of life. But they are telling you where you end up. So, obviously, um, it was part of my duty to represent what the mentality is, you know, for, for like, I have the chance to represent that uh, demonic system, in a way, to the Western uh, audiences and tell why these kids are so angry at school, why this is happening. So I hope that I was successful in sending out the message. Thank you so much. Very much so, thank you. <laughs> Hi Lale, if I can ask you next. Uh, I mean, what's interesting is that even though we have um, seen the Islamic regime in power for over 40 years. And there's been compulsory veiling, there's been compulsory sex apartheid. We know that the women 
in Iran never accepted it. I know everyone in the world called us an Islamic state and everyone said it's our culture and this is what women want in Iran. Uh, we love to be stoned and humiliated and degraded every day. That's our culture. Um, but they, women never accepted that and they didn't from the 1979 protest on International Women's Day. Tell us about that. Uh, well... <coughs> In 1979, when uh, Khomeini came with the message that hijab, uh, all women must have hijab, and then close to International Women's Day, so there clearly the new um, uh, women liberation movement started to, the, it was born. It was born from there, a women liberation uh, movement where they say that no to the hijab and no to the apartheid, gender apartheid, sexual apartheid. So from that day, so the fight between the Islamic State and this new newborn uh, movement started and never give up that, that, on that. And the reason is that actually this new liberation movement was anti-religion, anti-Islamic from the beginning. Because the Islamic Republic came with the message from all the Sharia law, including hijab and all the other misogynistic that later on that they put it on the constitution. And the new, newborn uh, liberation movement say no to all of them because that was the way that they wanted to react it. We usually say that, that uh, women's movement in Iran is a uh, Ashilian uh, hill of the Islamic Republic. And after 44 years, and during all these years, women targeted this hill, and today we can see that, that they, ta they, they uh, hit this uh, hill. So therefore, this movement in Iran is quite separate from other women movement in the in, uh, area, in the region. And the unique thing is that they clearly say to any kind of the religion, any kind of pressures from Islamic state, political Islam, and exactly like Islamic politics that in Iran starting to spread all over the world, actually women liberation in Iran spread in the area, supported the, or had it influence on the Afghanistan, on Iraq, and Kurdistan of Iraq as well. We had it so much common fight against uh, each region's Islamic state that all of them are coming from one background of this uh, movement. So therefore, it's unique in, uh, from Iran, and it's spread in the area. I think it influenced the whole world today as well in whole Europe. And uh, it's so clear that they are anti-Islamic, anti-religious, and then they don't accept any kind of culture, customs, any excuses from any religious background. That's Thank it. you, Halale. Uh, Zara. <laughs> Zara, I wanted to talk to you because, of course, you, um, you started Faithless Hijabi. And this is very different reality to what we hear a lot of in the West, that any sort of criticism is Islamophobic and the veil is a tool for liberation and empowerment of women. That's what we always hear. And there's always a, a, f a demand for the right to veil, but we never really hear about the demand of the right to be unveiled. Um, so tell us a bit about that. I think particularly in the West where Islam is a minority religion or followed by a, minor a minority or a marginalized group, it's often infantilized, it's often excused for, and most, almost always the criticism of Islam is conflated with the criticism of the people. And I think that because that mindset is widely adopted by a lot of Westerners, they're the ones actually... I think it's quite discriminatory. They're actually being quite racist because they're having different standards for different women. They don't question why hijab even exists in the first place. You'll never see them 
um, you'll never see them arguing against FGM, for instance, or like for FGM. They'll always be against. But when it comes to hijab, there's a certain kind of ignorance. We're like, it's, it's their culture. Let them do it. They have different standards for people. And that, you know, every time that we talk about our right to be free from hijab, they are the ones taking offense to it while, while they don't even wear it. They weren't even raised in the environment where we've been brainwashed to wear it. That movie like, spoke to me so much because while I was never raised in Iran, I was raised very similarly with like literally all the Shia teachings. So I didn't know what it was like not wearing the hijab. And that's the reality for so many women in the West, within their communities, not understanding where it came from. And I think that's what really drives and empowers a lot of Islamists as well. Because the West have you know, brought up Islamophobia, I think a lot of Islamists continue using that and trying to silence people who dare to question it. So if anything, the liberals in this case, or the so-called liberals, are actually empowering radicals. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Elika, I was uh, reading in an interview you did about the fight you had to bring your father home. And congratulations that he's home. We're all very happy. He felt like part of our family as well. So um, that was wonderful news for us. But we have many more people still in prison there. Um, you mentioned in an interview that when you were fighting for your father, you felt like a fly against an elephant. Uh, in, in a sense, it gave me the sense that you felt quite powerless. Um, and I wonder if you feel the same way now or even... even given that your father came back, but also given this woman's revolution that we're seeing in Iran. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mariam. Uh, yeah, when my dad was taken, I mean, we were an extremely apolitical family. We uh, had, from a young age, we, my parents told us if we wanted to have freedom of movement in Iran, not to get involved with politics. And um, we were quite um, art-oriented. I did acting and art, and my brother's into music, and my parents likewise. So when what happened to my dad happened, it took us by such surprise that um, if six years ago someone has said to me that I'd be here in a political panel, I would have told them to readjust their medicine. And um, I think what I went through, uh, because we were quiet for two years uh, on the advice of the Foreign Office because they didn't want us to make noise. And obviously that was the wrong approach. But when we did finally come public... I was faced with, you know, naively I thought that it would um, get a lot of uh, attention. I was, in fact, the day that I publicly posted about my dad's arrest, I thought I was going to be flooded with lots of journalists and media and politicians asking to know more. And nothing happened. It was silent. And that started a massive uphill battle for us to be noticed. And... It, it was shocking to me because I'd seen previous cases um, of political prisoners get international attention. And I knew subconsciously why, but it was when I was um, in front of the Foreign Office uh, protesting one day, and a journalist came to me and said, well, we do you have children? And I said, no. And he said, do you have a partner who is of a Caucasian race. And I said, no. And he said, well, sorry, your news is not sexy news. And that's what I knew I was dealing with. We were just a Middle Eastern family in, you know, with a Middle Eastern dad who was older and we are grown up and we had to fight to get him out. So that struggle was there and the infrastructural prejudices and biases that exist in the Western world wouldn't allow us to get recognized. And it wasn't just the West. At the time, there was the case of fear and paranoia that hadn't been shattered yet amongst the Iranians inside Iran and in the diaspora. So when, when we did Iranian interviews or where we did tell Iranian people of our plight, the only thing we were faced with was 
anger and death threats and wishes that my dad would hang and that he is a spy. So that, I feel, prepared me for what was about to come. At the time, I didn't know. But when the Women Life Freedom Movement started and my dad was freed, and that fear amongst the Iranian people shattered, I knew that that's when people could see this government for what they actually are and that they could kill people for no reason and they could arrest people for no reason. And I felt prepared that 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 journey wasn't for nothing and that people can jail revolutionaries, but they can't jail an entire revolution. And um, I feel like... Now everyone is on the same boat and we have all suffered the lack of um, being recognized by the West. We have all suffered the lack of attention and staying relevant amongst politicians and in the media. Um, and I don't feel like a fly on the wall anymore. Okay, thank you. But I, w I was going to say uh, you were hanging out with the wrong people because... <laughs> There are lots of political activists who've been active for many decades, and I know they also were active around the um, hostages. Um, I'm going to ask one question from Azar, and then I'm not going to go to my second round of questions so that you can all have comments and ask questions. So for Azar, I'd like to ask, um, you know, sort of when you look at the characteristics of this revolution, um, it is very modern, very secular. Tell us a bit about what these characteristics are, why these characteristics are so significant, and why it's different today uh, than it has been uh, in previous protests. <clears throat> well, to be honest with you, for me, it's no, uh, no, nothing strange that you see so much modernism in Iran and the f uh, force for secularism, Actually, atheism, anti-religion, is not only secularism in the context that we know here in Britain, you know, just the separation of church from the state. Even France is more, like they use laïcité, they have more restrictions on the involvement of religion in the running of the society. But there's a lot of uh, fe uh, feelings against, uh, for atheism, against religions in general, uh, for a v free cu culture, all of that, for me, for you, and for many of us who have, I mean, I haven't lived in Iran for 40 years, but I know even when I was young, it was different. So what you get here in the West is, is very distorted. Or now maybe it's coming out that apparently Iran, um, you know, people just love to have chadors, love to have this hijab, love to have covered themselves, and you know, all of that. That's never been the case. We have always said that women's liberation movement in Iran is the, one of the most important pillars of the change in Iran, revolutionary change in Iran. I mean the whole society changing, not just women's rights. You cannot change just women's rights and expect that women are equal. You need to change the whole society. For a better world, a society that respects freedom, equality, prosperity for all. You can't have just women being equal, everything fine, but everything else, class and gender and race and all of that still are being suppressive in a society. So we knew that women's liberation movement is going to be an important force. We've said that for the past 30 years. Our movement have said, and now we see it. We see it that women's liberation movement in Iran triggered a revolutionary movement for change, for bringing down Islamic regime, and not just bringing Islamic regime and accept anything else that's given. No, a society that respects freedom, equality, and prosperity. And that's where we come and see all these uh, debates maybe people here are not familiar with between the right opposition and the left opposition. is a very strong right opposition. Strong. They have a lot of money. Right opposition and, no, really, they have a lot of money and they're supported by the U.S. and NATO. Regime change. The concept of the 21st century. This is what actually you could be worried about too. That, that, that's what they're preparing for. And a very vast leftist organization, movement, sorry, not only abroad, 
in Iran. You see, you have to, you, 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 when I, in the eighth March that Halale talked about, I was there. I was a very young girl, younger than my daughter who's sitting here, much younger. And I was with full of enthusiasm and full of revolutionary aspirations. We thought we're going to get a free society. I mean, workers are going to be equal. We're going to have a... So I mean, that's how I went to that society. That's how I went to 8th March. We were um, organizing our first free 8th March. Don't think that the re regime before that, the monarchies, we had we rights. No way. Very similar to what happened in the Islamic regime. That was the first 8th March we ever celebrated or organized and had meetings in Iran. That was after the Shah was toppled. And that day, we had this spontaneous mass protest, I can call it. Maybe it sounds a bit exaggeration, but thousands and thousands of women, public employees who were told at 6 o'clock in the morning by the radio they have to observe the veil, and people who all heard it and were there. And we were there. It was funny. It was snowing like today. When I was coming, I got very nostalgic today. When I was coming here and seeing the snow and walking under the snow, I really went 44 years back. It was naive, but it, it was naive, but it was beautiful. You really thought you have freedom in your hands. You really, it's so, so different when you live through a revolution, and that's what we did. But everything went wrong. There was this Islamic regime who everybody thought because Iranian people were so Muslim, so they had an Islamic regime. No, no, no. It was Guadeloupe Conference, you remember? P Brzezinski's Green Belt, you remember? The Middle East had to have Islam, so it's sort of, you have a good belt against then Soviet Union, leftism and communism. They made Khomeini our leader by BBC. BBC Farsi broadcasting every night told us what Khomeini, our leader, has broadcasted that day. They, all the press releases were read by the BBC Farsi, and that was the only, there was no uh, social media, there was not even CNN, it was only radios we had to listen to, and every day BBC told us, and Voice of America. Anyway, so this, 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 this is, it was very much expected what happened. I only mention one thing. The revolution in Iran will have a very important influence in the history of not only Iran, the region under Islam, and I think even World War, very much like the great French Revolution of 1789, you remember, when the church was taken down almost, when the power of religion was cut down and you had the Renaissance and laicite coming to power, I think Iranian revolution would have the same effect. Thank you. Thank you, Aza. Why don't, why don't we open it up now to all of you? Feel free to make comments. You don't only have to ask questions. You can challenge what you've heard. And uh, um, you can also uh, bring points that you think are important. Uh, so feel free. We have uh, a few minutes to have a discussion. Khadija. My name is Khadija Khan. I'm a journalist and commentator. I watched this movie. Thank you so much for making this one. I'm from Pakistan, but not for a moment I thought that I haven't heard this before. All my life, all my childhood, all my teenage years, I, I was brainwashed with the same words, with the same rhetoric, and I internalized this all misogynistic beliefs. And for a long time in my life, I didn't have any problem with that because this is the reality of this Islamic society that many women, they internalize the misogyny that stems from the Islamic discourse. It comes from the religion, it comes from the beliefs, it comes from the traditions. And we, many women, they don't even realize that they have internalized this misogyny. So this uh, movie, every word of it, every uh, visual of it resonates with so many women uh, who are maybe who have internalized this misogyny or who are fighting against this uh, Islamic misogyny, religious misogyny, as I call it. And we need to be united. As you said, 
Iranian revolution is not limited to the Iran because we have the same beliefs, misogynistic beliefs, same traditions, rituals dis- uh, discriminate, that discriminate against women. And the revolution that is unfolding in Iran, it's going to have a huge impact in all those society where these beliefs are imposed on women. So united we stand. Happy International Women Day. Thank you so much. Hello, um, my name is Zin. Um, I work in documentary research. I just want to say, th- um, Mashad, your film, absolutely fantastic. Loved it. And thank you generally to everyone for making this happen today. Really a privilege to be here. Um, this question is inspired um, by the um, excellent recent exhibition at the Barbican. I don't know if anyone saw it. A Rebel Rebel um, by Sokan, uh, Sahela Sakanvari. Absolutely brilliant about, um, pre, uh, about feminist cultural icons in pre-revolutionary Iran and the challenges they faced um, both before then uh, and after 1979, but also obviously the achievements that they, um, that they, um, that they did. So I want to just ask um, if each of you guys could, could maybe share with us the, um, uh, the, 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 the women in, in, in culture and in the public sphere, insofar as they were present, um, who inspired you and why they did so, and whether you and the kinds and if you could talk about the kinds of um, issues you're aware that they might have faced and how you might relate to them yourselves. Thank you. Shall we ask, uh, see if there's any other questions or comments before I give it back to you? Hi, my question would be, what steps or safeguarding measures can, we t- can be taken to ensure that this time the revolution is not going to be taken over by some bad actors like last time? Like, what can we learn? Like, what was done wrongly last time? You mentioned the BBC. What, what can we do to make sure that it's not happening again? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Azad Neman. Um, I, with the march you were talking about, my mom was there without me against her job. Uh, for some reason, she didn't take me that day. Um, now, I have a single question. A lot of time in the news, you see what's happening in the Middle East, and somehow it feels like Iran is cut out of it. When you have the Hoi earthquake, for example, there is a um, picture of Sudan and uh, Syria, sorry, and Turkey. And ar- ironically, there are um, uh, trucks from Iran taking uh, aid there, but they are denying the people in Iran the same aid, and you are not in the news. Uh, when they talk about the gassing in, in the schools, it's a very small, um, mild kind of report from what's happening in the schools in Iran. It's like you have this pain, and it's been denied that it exists. Um, Whatever is the political reason behind it, I'd like to know how would you break through it? And how would we um, break through this barrier that has been created against us to, to, for, so the world can know the pain that is experienced by the Iranians inside Iran? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. I'll just give it to Nahanda and then you can respond maybe. I don't know if this is going to be a really naive question or difficult to answer. Just my question would be, is there sort of a layman's argument we can put forward to Western women to let them know it is their place to speak up? Because I think a lot of women, they're almost turning their head because they think it's not my place. Like as women, we, you know what I mean? we're told it's not your place. And I think a lot of women are looking at this and thinking, I'm not. I don't know enough about this. Is there an argument we can put forward that, that open women's eyes to say these are we, we are we are all sisters in this fighting together? Is there something we can do to make Western women more engaged? Thank you, Nahanda. Go ahead. Uh, would you like to just whoever would like to respond first and go ahead? Um, first of all, starting with the last, is not only is not only Iran, Syria. There is sanction on it and they are not getting any food or any help there. And not only that, Israel is bombarding Syria. So it's not, it's just the whole geopolitics and the world order, I cannot get into it. So if there's no aid, Syria is even in worse situation because US has put sanction on Syria. And then uh, it was, um, who inspired you? Which woman, he asked. I must tell you, it wasn't a woman, it was a man. 
It was my dad. My dad was a Marxist. He was very enlightened and liberated. He told me that I can have anything I want and I have the same right as my brother. And he allowed me to stand against anybody I wanted from grandmother to the school principal and he defended me. And uh, that's why maybe I'm so much against toxin, uh, toxicity creation among men and women. Look at Iran now. Men and women hand in hand are burning the hijab. This is the, revolu this is the liberation women movement of Iran that has actors, both men and women. In this identity politics of today, there is so much toxicity. Please don't get into that. We are human beings. We're fighting for a better society and a just society. Gender equality is one of them. And I just say one more thing on the, your question. I'm glad you asked. I am one of those who is incredibly worried about the plans of regime change that US and NATO have in their mind. Monique Conference was one of them. They're doing it. I cannot get into it. And I've been writing about it in the past six months and making videos and talking about it. We need the solidarity of progressive organizations, working workers' organization, decent, human-loving people of Europe. We want the West to stop supporting, but just to stop there. We don't want you to get involved. Please, don't get involved. We can handle it ourselves. Look at the Middle East. Look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Sudan. We don't want another one of those. Regime change. We must all say no, solidarity with the pe people of Iran and women of Iran, yes. Thank you, Azar. Uh, well, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about yeah, it. Go ahead, Mashad, and maybe you just take turns just, and go yeah, down. Okay, yeah, so um, has regarding inspiration, I would say um, maybe I didn't have... Um, very, very strong woman to look up to in terms of a political activist or something. But my mom, uh, as a woman who went through the same suffering, who was kind of, she's a poet, she's a, you know, amazing artist, but she had to bear, like, bury all her dreams for us to grow up. But she gave me one very precious message. And she told me, Don't let, I, I cut my wings for yours to grow. Oh. So fly as much as, as high as you can, because uh, that was my dream. So. Uh, for me, who inspired me, I think it's not just one person or one thing. I think we are fluid creatures and... Uh, we continue to be inspired every day by everything that happens. Um, throughout my journey, I've been inspired by the daughters of the political prisoners who have been taken in Iran and their families and the way they fight every single day for their freedom and their resilience. And no one is a victim in this. The, the way that we carry ourselves, and I see these girls fight, and they do it with passion, and they make jokes, and you know, no one sitting in a corner crying and uh, th it's this attitude that inspires me to do more and as a millennial growing up in Iran um, I'm almost embarrassed that I was born when I was and we just uh, put our heads down and obediently followed the rules and when I see the Gen Z's now and the way they give a big you know F you to the uh, Khamenei's photo and uh, they show their hair and for the West, and this comes to your question as well as what we can do, we can take off our kind of rosy lens of feminism that we have in the West of, you know, things that are now secondary in the world of feminism, you know, like pronouns, etc., which are quite important, but in Iran... Feminism hasn't even been born yet. You know, people, are, the girls uh, get married as young as nine. Women can't have certain jobs. Um, women don't have the same right as men. And women can't watch football games. You know, there are these basic human rights that women don't have. So if you are a feminist, if you are a Western feminist, it's time to really go back to the roots and look at this problem from the 
deep root down up and uh, really see whether, you know, w what's worth the fight. A girl who's getting married at nine or, you know, things that we have taken for granted for so long here. So I think those girls are my inspiration and um, all the people that are currently fighting in Iran as well. Well, um, uh, my mom was couldn't read and write, and uh, but she was always my uh, she isp inspired me a lot. Uh, I my father never talked wi with me. I don't remember when somebody call uh, ask me what the memory for with your father. I don't have anything really, because he was in charge like a landlord be in village or look after the mark or land. And then he never was at home with us. But my mother was challenging me all the time. In the revolution 1979, she was always in every single demonstration, in the first line. And she used to knock on the door of the neighbor and say, that, come mothers, because our children are going to the demonstration. We must make a shield in front of them. Maybe they will be beat by the uh, troops. And she was so, when she lost her two sons in the fight of Kurdistan, she stand up on his, their grave and she made it a speech without a tear in her eyes. She cried a lot in background, but she knew that if she will cry on the grave, all the friends of my brothers, we are all were freedom fighters, Peshmerga. She was worried about those Peshmerga. She said that I must strong, stand strong because they need me at the moment. For every lust in our town, my mother was number one. Go to the mother and say that stand strong with our alliance, with our Peshmerga, because they need us. We will fight this regime. I remember in the telephone, last message to me when she died. She said that we couldn't make it in Iran. But when you are coming back, come and see me. So she, she is my hero. I wanted to follow up with the, what others said about the guarantee for what not happening. Uh, the, the bad history doesn't repeat again, like 1979. You know, in my opinion, there is no guarantee, but there is way that we can learn from the past and then trying to make it this time stronger with our unity. Like others say that it was a lot passion in 1979. But it wasn't uh, organized. It wasn't so clear what we wanted, really. And our alliance wasn't so unit, uh, united and strong enough to make it a manifesto and drag all the uh, workers, all the unity, all the people. But this time is different. This time, even on the pressure of 44 years in Iran, Working class, whenever they wanted to make it any uh, uh, organizing, anything, their leaders have been arrested, their family been vanished, the hunger, of, uh, the hunger make them to uh, die even. And then even the same for women organization. Whenever they started with any organization, any organizing, immediately they have been uh, uh, imprisoned, they have been tortured, they have been vanished, raped, they have to leave the country by force, by force of the regime. So therefore, this organizational uh, element that is really, really in, in, uh, important in a revolution and win, it, 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 there isn't so strong. There is, but it's not that much big because of the pressure of these 44 years in Iran. But because this time unity 
and the um, uh, what can I say that people people knows more. Working class is more smarter. They knows about their right. Women's movement, women liberation movement knows more a lot about them. Their leaders are more smarter, uh, brilliant. Compare it with me. I was teenager in revolution, and I was so young and so passionate. But when I compare Massa at the same age, even I was younger than Massa, with my age at that time, the new generation are more strong, uh, smarter, and then they know what, uh, about their right. At the time, we, did, uh, we weren't so sure what is exactly women's right, really, exactly like others mentioned it. But this time, there is a lot uh, learning that people, working class, women's movement, all other uh, social movement, social group, have learned of that. We are hoping that maybe, for example, the charter, the charter si being signed by 20 uh, trade union, feminist group, other social group in Iran. And then there is a minimum demand, which is really, really good. Uh, at least we, in this stage, it's good. It's not perfect, but it's good. It shows sign of that people or those protesters or those movement in Iran can talk, can communicate, can write manifesto, and can, can decide it for their destiny, for their future. So it doesn't need that Western state decided for people what to do. So with this hope, maybe we can say that this time it will be a stronger chance to win. Thank you, Halala. Did you want to? I'll try making this quick, but I actually had a response to your question on how to encourage Westerners, especially Western women. Um, but I think you can all relate that we all have mates who will say, we're not political people, right? Everybody. But then the next day they retweet or post um, videos from Andrew Tate and, you know, different people uh, opposing that. Well, you have made it political because you are supporting or opposing how women are treated or should be treated. So this is no different. And kind of just reiterating Elika, yeah, Elika's point on going back to the basics. I feel like we can actually play like, you know, the same cards dealt when they talk about racism. Because I've noticed like living in Sweden, which is considered to be like one of the most feminist countries. They talk about white feminism. They're not talking about feminism that affect different cultures. It's so ignored. So I would actually pull the race card, and I'm like, what about other women who are Swedish, but they don't look like you and have their own troubles in their own communities and their homes, and we don't want to talk about it because, you know, somehow you're racist. And I'm like, no, you're just not a feminist if you don't talk about it. You can't just actively ignore what other women are facing and then call yourself um, an activist or like even a feminist. If you value equal pay, you must value equal for pay for all women, not just women who look like you. Um, and I think um, I'm actually quite jealous of all of you having your parents as inspiration. I think despite not growing up in Iran, my parents grew up very much like Iranians. So we're very submissive, you know, hardcore Shias, the Yahusains. Um, and <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, but my inspiration had to be somebody that looked like me, that came from a similar culture, and she's actually in this room, and she knows it. Like I'm fangirling her every time I see her. It's Mariam. I'm not doing this because. <laughs> uh, yeah, I also have something to add, uh, and that's um, well, I I was not a political person. I was arrested a few times in Iran for a strand of hair. I was lucky that I got, didn't get killed. And next time it got uh, more severe until the day that I decided to choose exile. At the time that I exiled, I came, luckily I could manage to go to university. And uh, me and Nazarene Zaghari Radcliffe, we were at the same university. She was not political. 
she went back and forth to Iran, traveled there. While for 16 years, I haven't been able to see my family, and, and uh, I was here. Um, but she eventually got caught. I was at London Film School when I met Alika, and then she was in my movie later on. She wasn't a political person, but her father got caught in Iran, and now she's an activist. So it's not about you being a feminist or a political. It's about you remaining silent against injustice. And that's what I'm asking the Westerners. Are you going to remain silent? silent when there is injustice happening around the world, especially for Iranian women in such situation? That is the question. You don't need to be against Islam or, you know, saying, like, this is a cultural matter or any of this. No, it's just a very simple uh, human question. Are you going to remain silent when, when other people are being treated like that in other places or not? You're going to have a voice. You're going to stand for them, for, for the voiceless. Thank you. Is, is there... Yes. We have, we have about five more minutes, so... Uh, this will be the last round. If you don't have your hand up now, that's it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to touch on the ins inspirational question. Um, I think it was great that your father was your inspiration. Um, I would say it's not inspiring. I would say that that's what a parent should do to a child. But my question is, do you think women can have freedom if men don't stand up and reject their privilege? Um, and what advice would you give to men who want to amplify the voices of freedom? Because in my opinion, true allyship is not true allyship if you're not ready to give up your privilege, if it means other people can live in a more equitable and equal life and society. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask, uh, let everybody ask their questions or make comments, and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, as a man, uh, young man, so uh, I, I don't see uh, any, any barrier for, I mean, to see the women, they are in the front line, and so they are fighting for their freedom, equality, and other things. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe this is a very special revolution, which uh, lead by the uh, women and collectively, collectively. And uh, I call it organic revolution. Why? Because I don't see any pollution, political pollution, and one person be a leader and telling other people what to do. Yeah, and then it's very collective, and it's not against the men, even encourage men and everybody to get together. And uh, yeah, the other thing is, so they challenge all sort of the inequality in, this, in, in the society. It's not, as they mentioned, it's not only gender inequality. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think it has got a lot of capacities, this movement, yeah. So, and hasn't got a border, can go everywhere. Thank you. Um, I wanted to actually uh, make a comment on the question the lady in the corner asked about why it should be important for women in the West or European women to support this movement. I want to actually give a different perspective to you. Um, you need to look at it as why it should be important for you. And the reason is these type of regimes that are extremists, that are patriarchal, actually inspire other states to do the same. So you have an example of Andrew Tate. You have Trump. You even have in the UK, they're trying to take, they're talking about taking trans rights away, for example. The women of Iran are actually fighting for your rights. So the reason it should be important for you is you don't want that extremism to come in the UK. It's already happened in America because they've taken women's abortion rights away. So I'm giving that perspective for you to be able to connect with the women in the Middle East because there's a disconnect. We say solidarity, we say why it should be because we're fighting for you should be political. But look at it as the fact that that regime, those kind of regimes actually enforce misogyny in these kind of countries. For example, where a BBC article comes out calling this mass hysteria of girls in Iran being attacked with a chemical gas. And that is misogynistic because hysteria is a very sexist term. So that's why I think it should be very important for Western women 
to support this movement. And I think uh, we just have one final question or comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful speeches. I, I just had a, a question because um, it was said uh, earlier, especially from Azar, about how the revolution or the change will happen from the Iranian people in Iran. And it's wonderful that we're having these conversations, but we are the diaspora. We are living outside and, and we're the outsiders looking in. But my question is, part of the problem in the diaspora is that we have so many different opinions of how Iran should change. And we're fighting amongst ourselves in the last six months. We've seen, you know, the, the uh, people who support the Shah, the people who are fighting for a more for leftist lens. How can we reconcile all these different uh, opinions and see that we're fighting for a common goal? And what can we do as part of the Iranian community in the West to amplify the voices while also stopping this infighting? Because it's Sometimes it feels like we're falling apart in the seams in that way. So, thank you. Oh, you guys are early. Have a seat. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and you're not even Iranian. I mean, we would expect that from Iranians. <laughs> um, I, I really, I'm so sorry. We, we only have five minutes, but I, you guys have to be really short then. Hi, thank you all for your contributions. It's been really interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask a question because um, we know that Iran is obviously a very eth ethnically and culturally and linguistically diverse country. And there's obviously an ethnic dimension to the protests that have been going on. And given that it started from the Kurdish region in Iran, this entire protest, I was wondering how you reconcile the fights for ethnic rights with those of um, women's and feminist rights within this movement. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have only five minutes, so briefly, if we can get a response from all of you, starting with Azar. Well, I was asked two particular two questions. Go ahead. Well, you know, um, <laughs> I move my hands all the time. That's what happened, sorry. You know, um, we used to call it male chauvinism when I was younger, and I, or women's question, and I always thought this is much better than you know other ways. But whatever, this gender inequality is an ideology and a sort of dominant narrative of roles in the society that is perpetuated by the economic system, political economy system. I can't go further into that, but if you look at it that way, then when you talk about male privilege. That ideology tells you the fact that if man doesn't wash dishes and woman does, then man has privilege. But you can look at it differently. You see, it's this capitalist society that puts value on everything with money. So if woman stays home and takes care of her baby for a year, that's bad because she's not getting paid. But when you, look at, when, when you get to my age, I say, God, that was such a privilege to spend that time with my babies. That was the only meaningful life I had when I was with my babies. So it's the question of dominant ideology. Once you have a revolution, this dominant ideology gets all sort of moved and turned, and you can turn the ideas. And then you're not talking about privilege, but you talk about harmony. You talk about living together, being humanity, and equal humanity. And there was another question. Someone asked me where. Oh, yes about the diaspora. See, there are some conflicts you can't do anything about. Right and left don't match. I have nothing to do with monarchy. I have fight with them every day. So how am I going to have? No way. But if you have same aspirations, you want the society to be a better world for everybody, something that people in Iran want. They keep shouting equality, freedom. And then... You, you can solidify, you can show your uh, um, uh, solidarity, you can show your support, you can be on the streets, you can have these meetings, you can give them support. This is something that um, you have to, you know, if it works, I have to be so quick. I'm so and Just I'm one, sorry. one point on that ethnicity, I'm sorry. Uh, we respect the equal rights of everybody in Iran, 
and everyone should be allowed to speak their mother tongue, to study in their mother tongue. I think this is the best way you can have people from different ethnicity and speaking different languages, living in a uh, society that uh, uh, respects equal rights. Thank you, Aza. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you each uh, a chance to say a few sentences, please. Thank I'm just going to say uh, just one couple of words, and that's uh, regarding the Kurdish minority. I believe uh, it was amazing that Mahsa Jina Amini was the cause of this revolution because it brought the idea of intersectionality and the importance of it in the context of this revolution, which was the most important uh, and the most amazing thing for me personally. So pass. Thank you, Masha. Uh, yeah, and for uh, the question about what the, the, the diaspora's conflict, um, as you said as well, every every country has a difference of opinion. I think what we don't have as a society in Iran is the education from the bottom up, from when we were young, of critical thinking, analytical thinking, and accepting each other's differences. So it is okay to... Um, disagree. It's absolutely fine to have different ideas. Uh, at the end of the day, it, we don't have to be hostile about it, and we have to learn that the basic um, rules of democracy is that the people with the majority who agree on a certain idea will win and serve a term, and then there would be another term for another choice. And if we really learn to believe that and know that at this moment in time, the only thing that we have is one common enemy and one common goal, and that's to get rid of the Islamic regime, then we're fine. Thank you, Elifa. Alale. <laughs> Uh, even I'm Kurd, and I should answer this question, but the group all <laughs> answered My mom's Kurd. I just wanted to say that one of the unique things with the revolution in Iran right now, uprising, was that actually, as much as in Shah time and in uh, Islamic Republic, those uh, minority group, those um, other nations, have been under attack and discrimination, uh, the revolution showed the unity, and uh, they, they wanted to show that to even, especially monarchy as well, that uh, you can't divide us in pieces, but as well as we must respect them equally. And this is really, really important. This is one of the good points with the revolution. I also wanted to say that actually, uh, I'm dealing with the community here in the UK, uh, with those women that sometimes when I look at them, it looks like that they are still living in the villages of Pakistan, Kurdistan, Turkey, or other things when it's going to the man dominated and the stru structure, cultural structure, those communities that we are working with. It looks like that it's not England. It's, uh, it looks like it's a two-tier uh, uh, rules for in the community. My hope is that the revolution in Iran actually had, have influence on those community that they will change for a better for those women as well, women and children as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Azar, Mashad, Elika, Halale, and Zara. Thank you. We've uh, finished our panel. Thank you for your questions and comments. <laughs>